Well, good morning, everyone. Um, this is the early recognition and management of sepsis in the home health care setting. Um, I will give it just maybe one more minute to see if uh, anyone else joins us today, and then we'll get started. Just a minute or two. I'll repost. Um, everyone should have received a reminder email that had many documents in it, uh, the handouts and our whole toolkit now, as well as the PowerPoint presentations for sessions one, two, and three. But just in case, and I've heard some people don't know if they join at a different time, I'm going to again paste the slides for today. This is the PDF file of the slides for today if you want them right now um, as we go along. So they're posted in chat if you're interested. Okay. All right. I think we're about four minutes after the top of the hour, so we'll get going here today. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm Barb Link. I'm with Superior Health Quality Alliance. Uh, and we work in three states uh, through our work, uh, Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. And um, I'm out of the Michigan area and I work with MPRO, which is the quality improvement organization for the state of Michigan. Um, and we also work with Metastar in Wisconsin and uh, Stratus Health in Minnesota. So um, you all, depending on where you're from, might be more familiar with those organizations, but Superior Health is our umbrella organization for our CMS work and our quality improvement efforts. So quite happy to have you here today. Uh, as I said, this is the early recognition and management of sepsis, session number three for um, home health agencies. Today, um, the presenters, have they, as they have been for the last uh, two sessions are Eric Wilson, who's the Director of Nursing and Quality at Optimal Care, Inc., and Joshua Swire. Is it Swire? I should probably know how to pronounce your last name, Josh. Um, he's the Quality Improvement Advisor uh, for Superior Health along with me. So, um, and as many of you might know, the content for these sessions was developed actually in conjunction with Eric and uh, Pat Poza. So we always like to give Pat a little recognition. So um, just to let you know, I think we've talked about this before, but just a quick refresh and overview. I know maybe uh, there might be a new person joining us today in support of another person at an agency. So the program design, it's evidence-based and uh, best practice education and training on the protocols and tools necessary for early recognition and management of sepsis. It's case-based, interactive, and, and integrated team approach with all healthcare professionals at your particular setting. It includes home health agencies and discharging facilities. It utilizes performance improvement plan methodology, and it includes required data collection over the period of improvement of the project and beyond. And it also includes tracking and trending that data. So what the results are is that participating agencies will implement a sepsis protocol, and that would include improving screening and identification of septic patients receiving home health services, improve identification of patients with sepsis, it improves early interventions for patients with sepsis, it reduces admissions and readmissions at the 30 and 90 day mark, reduces the severity of sepsis when admission is required. It assesses current infection prevention practices for pneumonia, UTIs, and wounds. It implements one infection prevention practice to close the gap between current state and best evidence practice for each infection. 
and then it reduces mortality rates for those with sepsis and it saves lives. So what are the expectations for the agencies participating in this program? It's that you would be implementing the sepsis screening tool and treatment protocols as provided from the Early Recognition and Management Sepsis Program for home health agencies. Participate in the monthly learning sessions as you are today. Participate in optional coaching calls that occurred between session one and two and the submission of the process data. So we had the pre-work that happened before the session started, and that was to watch the videos that were sent out to you, and then attend the three virtual 90-minute sessions there in consecutive months. This is session number three. And then um, the one coaching call between session one and two was um, optional for this group. And so now I'll turn it over to Josh to talk about what we did last session and start the round robin. Thanks, Barb. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Josh Swire. Uh, if you weren't able to attend the last two sessions, um, actually, I know it has me down as a presenter today, but I, I can't take too much credit because I think Eric is going to be doing the majority of the presentations today. Um, and just a couple of things that Barb had mentioned that I wanted to elaborate on. Um, it, the slides that mentioned that there's a coaching call between sessions one and two. Please know that those are available through the whole program. So if you do need a coaching call from myself or Eric, please reach out to Barb and get that scheduled. These are also have been recorded and they're posted on YouTube. So if anybody's watching this out in YouTube land and it's after the event, please reach out to Superior Health. Um, we can absolutely still. Um, if you're part of our three states, Michigan, Wisconsin, um, and Minnesota, reach out to your health. We can we can assist um, with anything that. Um, so last session we really focused on implementation. Oops, I would only say, Josh, I, yeah. you're going in and out a little bit. Maybe if you could get closer to your computer or your audio, that would be great. Thanks. Is that any better? That's a hundred percent better. Great. Okay. Okay, um, so uh, so I'll just repeat myself a little bit. So if these are posted on YouTube. If anybody is, is reviewing these videos following this session, um, please reach out to Superior Health if you'd like a coaching call. We are available to give any um, resources and help. Um, we are here to assist. Um, so for last session, we discussed implementation strategies and patient education. We did make available the official um, toolkit that came out of this work. Um, and in that toolkit, it has all of these slides, it has the action plan, it has your meeting agenda, um, it really has set you up to be able to take this toolkit and hopefully run with it in your organization. It also includes that patient education, the stoplight toolkit that you can go ahead and feel free to brand, um, you know, all over that. That stoplight toolkit, it says, you know, insert logo here, insert agency name here. But, you know, the whole point of this uh, program was really to provide you with the education and the tools so that you could implement this in your program. And um, although it might, it, it will require you to get medical staff buy-in, training your staff, um, the majority of these resources have been provided for you. Um, we also reviewed the sepsis screening audit tool that is a Excel document and then has been created to integrate directly into your floppy activities. Um, on a previous slide, Barb had mentioned that you can submit um, process data. Again, that's optional. Um, you know, again, we're here to help with any of your floppy activities regarding sepsis. So let's say that in the coming months you abstract you know, 20 or 25 charts a month and you would like some assistance and kind of monitor, monitoring trends over a quarter or over six months, we are here to help. We can help with kind of making that pretty and putting it into your floppy or your accreditation book. Next slide, please. So for today's session, we're gonna review homework um, and really the bulk of today, we're gonna be discussing infection prevention and strategies um, for pneumonia, urinary tract infection and best practices around wounds. Next slide, please. Okay, um, so we'll go right to a round robin. I know we um, we don't have, well, let's see, we have one, two, three, four, we have five participants, uh, six participants on the call today. 
So um, no need to go out into breakout sessions, I don't think. Um, we can just kind of open up the floor. Um, really, I know we don't have a copy of the action plan on here, but I can go through them. Um, as I discussed, really, the first steps was getting buy-in from your staff and your medical staff. So getting your team together, um, talking about the process, getting buy-in, talking to your, either your medical director, associate medical director, or your physician leader, getting buy-in on why screening and early intervention is appropriate, and then really defining and developing that screening tool and process. And again, that screening tool is available in the toolkit that we sent out. So really, uh, and those are based on best practices. So can they be altered to meet your needs? Yes. Um, I, I don't know what um, you know, like clinical indicators would probably wouldn't need to be altered. Really, it's kind of created as a plug and play. Just put your logo in, get your staff buy-in, uh, test it in a small test to change on, you know, five to six patients, see how it works, and um, yeah, kind of learn from it. Um, and then once you've defined your frequency of your screening process, which uh, best practices recommends at start of care, um, with every visit, and then with really every change of condition, um, visit. Um, you define content for who will receive the education and you develop that um, to also include patient family education processes. So again, we have that all created for you. It's called, it's the stoplight um, tool and that's available for you to print out and you can put that in all of your admission packets if you'd like. Um, it's got a lot of great tools for uh, patient and family education on when to call the nurse, when to call the agency, when versus maybe when to activate EMS. Um, and then really um, four through six really focused on also evaluating the screening audit. So Eric had presented that screening audit tool in our last session. Um, he went through a few examples of how to do a chart abstraction and kind of the value of that. So hopefully you were able to at least review that. Um, you, you have that saved. Um, so I just kind of want to open up the floor. Um, has anybody been able to implement, I know it says step four through six, and, um, you know, I'm here, we're here in Michigan, and, you know, Michigan's number two right now with uh, COVID cases, and we're at bed capacity again, so completely understand that sometimes some of these quality activities may not be the number one, you know, priority, especially with all the staffing difficulties we have. So, um, really, this isn't a time to say, you know, what, what have, you know, what haven't we done? It's more so, what have you done? Have we had conversations? Have we talked about implementing this? And it's okay if we ran into roadblocks. But I just want to open up the floor and and kind of get some some participant feedback on what we've learned so far. Good morning. This is Kay Rennie from Henry Floor. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Kay. Good morning. Uh, hi. How are you? Great. Thank you. So I'm here to. Um, so we at Henry Ford Home Healthcare instituted a sepsis question. We embedded it into our visit note. So at every visit, the clinician, whether it's a nurse, a therapist, um, the social worker has to, it, it's a hard stop, has to answer the question. So first it's, and we actually developed this based on MPRO's um, initial sepsis plan back in, so this was before I was here in this position. So I think like in two, 2018, yeah, okay. So we have that embedded into our visit note. They have to ask, they have to answer a question um, whether the patient has uh, two or more of the SERS criteria present. And if they do, then there's an algorithm and it flows out onto what their next steps are, what they're looking for next. And it's again based on that tool that we received back in 2018 from MPO. So it's been very effective. Um, we have, because I track our readmissions, we are getting much better at um, identifying patients that are possibly septic and sending them back to the hospital. Additionally, 
this past year, we developed a sepsis banner. So when the nurse opens the, or the clinician, excuse me, opens the patient record at the visit, there could be a sepsis banner present. And that banner may come and go. It's based on, of course, Sears criteria, as well as some lab values. So perhaps the patient um, goes in for some labs or has an inpatient procedure and has some inpatient diagnostic testing done, depending on those results, may trigger this banner. So there's three criteria, um, it's three criteria that would have to be positive. So if they had perhaps um, their white blood cells were up and the clinician did the vital signs and there were two uh, vital signs out of range, it would trigger this banner. And so it, we thought that this would be good for the clinicians to think as soon as they see that banner, is this patient septic? So that's been, the, we've gotten good feedback on that. Again, the banner comes and goes, it only stays there for seven days. So if the next visit, the vital signs are with, you know, that's determined that the patient wasn't septic at that visit, and then the next visit, the banner may just have disappeared because they went into the doctor's office, right? We sent them in because there was a suspicion and the vital signs were um, within range, it would, it would disappear. So we've done that. This past year, um, our focus, uh, one of our educational focuses was sepsis. And so I did presentations to, it was mandatory that all of our clinicians, home care clinicians, um, attended one of our presentations on sepsis. And in that presentation, we talked about um, what they might see in home care and, you know, especially a patient who had been discharge from a sepsis inpatient admission and the, the compensation and, you know, tips on getting therapy in there and helping them get stronger. But also the focus was on getting everybody comfortable asking, could it be sepsis? And teaching our patients and their families to say those words to the doctor. Um, unfortunately, fortunately, I was able to um, use a personal experience with a family member who has had sepsis twice in the last four years. Um, my brother, he doesn't fit any of the criteria. You know, he's young, no indwelling uh, procedure, or excuse me, no invasive procedures, no medication, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, he ended up septic. Um, and then again, just this past December, ended up was getting septic again. And that was when, of course, nobody could go into ERs with, our, with the patients. So anyway, I was able to make the story real um, for our clinicians. And again, the focus of that was a review of the septic, the tool, as well as the signs and symptoms and what to help our families. But again, getting our clinicians and their patients comfortable with saying, could it be sepsis? So that's what we've done so far here at Henry Ford Home Healthcare. And so I'm interested in the tool that has, um, is a part of this presentation so that we can update our information to make sure it's the most current. So thank you for inviting me. That's excellent. Thank you, Kay. Um, uh, yeah, and the actually the MPRO tool that you've integrated into your electronic health record is actually the, the, the same tool that we're using as part of this program. So I think you're, you're kind of ahead of the game in that respect. Um, we did, we might have modified one or two minor things. I believe there was, um, uh, I don't want to say discrepancy, but uh, a fever was defined as like 99 point something. And um, it's really 100.4. However, in the case of people that int integrated the 99 point, you know, let's just say eight um, into their EHR, at least it's on a lower threshold. So um, mm -hmm. we just found, you know, there might be a little bit of a higher, you know, false, um, false alerts, but at least it's not on the higher threshold, right? So, so that's excellent. It sounds like you have some clinical indicators and some visuals in your EHR built to flag clinical staff. Hey, somebody is flagging for sepsis and it stays there for seven days. So that's, that's excellent. Um, 
Eric, I don't know if you had anything else to add to um, the Kay's example. No, thank you for sharing, Kay. I wrote in the messages that I love that line um, asking, could it be sepsis? Uh, I think that's uh, really kind of engaging the patient and family in the easiest way. Um, and then the other thing that I I know we had talked about in previous sessions was personalizing uh, the scenario because I had talked about uh, in our agency, we had our initial uptake actually with speech therapy. Um, they were our first uh, people that we trained actually because uh, they see a lot of aspiration pneumonia and things like that um, because one of the therapists had a personal experience with sepsis and they were really kind of uh, wanted to really kind of lead, help help take the lead on the project because of that. So I think that really kind of hits home with the clinicians. And Kay, I bet you found too that when you're training your staff, it's really nice to be able to train them on something that's clinically relevant versus focusing on conditions of participation or changes in the OASIS. And they really, they really, the uptake of that is much, much more, much better from the staff, especially when we're focused on clinical. Agreed. All right, excellent. Anybody else? Anybody else? Um, it doesn't matter where you are, you know, in your journey on um, helping to identify sepsis. It could be, you know, you just started the conversation, but we're excited to hear from you. So anybody else want to give their perspective? Okay, alrighty. Well, then we'll go ahead and um, transition over into the bulk of today's presentation. And I'll hand it over to my colleague, Eric. Next slide, please. Thank you, Josh. Um, so today is really just about, it's kind of that performance improvement part on identifying and uh, or preventing infection in the home especially for the common scenarios that we see uh, in home care. Um, and that's really surrounded by skin, respiratory, uh, and urinary. So what we wanted to provide the group today with is your, uh, the already evidence-based um, measures, assessments, et cetera, that you can implement in your program um, as far as performance improvement project where where do you identify that you know what what we do is we take where is our highest hospitalization related patients um, in relation to infection uh, and then we take the, those patients and we build a performance improvement plan so in our agency um, two three years ago we had our highest related hospitalizations um, specific to respiratory related infections uh, and so we built the performance improvement plan around that where our ongoing surveillance and monitoring was done through sepsis screening, but we also implemented um, specific toolkits and uh, uh, clinical collaboration interventions in the field that the clinicians perform uh, to help reduce that risk. And so that's kind of from a floppy standpoint, that's kind of how you we tied everything together um, and using the best evidence-based practices out there. So hopefully the goal, I, I won't go into detail with every slide, but the goal is that you can take away from the presentation today, um, you know, you can pick your area where you feel or where you know, you really should know, it should be a feel, where your data tells you you need to work on performance improvement. So uh, I know um, for home health and hospice agencies right now, uh, the focus from CMS is performance improve. You know, your performance improvement is focused on COVID-19 outcomes, um, and so. But there's a lot that you can take from the respiratory section um, that flows over. But if you have other identified needs, um, there's nothing that says you can't uh, work on other performance improvement projects as well. So, uh, and I think Barb, do I have the um, ability just to move the slides or I got to ask. 
Okay, thank you. So first we'll talk about just wound infection. Part of this presentation too is to, you know, we want to be uh, cognizant of uh, antimicrobial stewardship as well. So, you know, not using antibiotics when we don't need to. Um, I think that could be a whole nother MPRO uh, four session. <laughs> we won't go there right now, but you know, everyone knows it's a big talk. Um, and so when we look at wounds, um, really, we're looking at the levels of bile burden and helping the clinical staff who's evaluating the wounds understand what that level means and what the treatment options are based on the different levels of bile burden. So contamination is typically what we see in a, in a traumatic wound or any other wound that's been you know, chronic or new, you know, just being contaminated from, from outside sources could even be as simple as uh, gravel or dirt or something like that. Um, and colonization, looking at the microbial balance or host control. And that's really what we're looking at is where does the bacteria travel? Does it, does it uh, rapidly expand within to the wound where you get critical colonization? Is it pretty stable in the wound where it's just colonization? Or is it, in, uh, is it intruding into the soft tissue um, with, within the wound and around and the surrounding area where we start to see infection where we really want to uh, get uh, treat, you know, kind of treatments started on that. Uh, next slide. So just kind of, you know, something to, to give your staff, uh, uh, and just my background, I'm a wound care certified nurse uh, um, uh, for seven years now, uh, and I've been mainly treating wounds in the home. Um, and so a lot of my practice is around more of the advanced wound care products, really avoiding some of the taboos like wet to dries, really being cognizant of what the wound bed looks like compared to um, you know, the surrounding tissue and how we're managing that. So, uh, uh, um, so that, that's kind of my background where I'm coming from with this. So I find these slides very effective with especially staff who aren't as familiar with wounds because you know, you, if you don't know what healing granulation tissue looks like or, or something like that, the wound in the first picture to, to a novice person might look like a horrible wound, you know, when really um, some of us who have been doing wound care for a long time, that looks like a great healing wound. You know, there's a couple of things that we could improve on, but overall, we've got some nice uh, VC red tissue coming in. So I think there's some good slides on here to show your staff, especially those who are really struggling. I think that's one of the big things in home care when you enter into the home care and hospice world. Um, uh, they don't have the experience with the wound um, that, that the visiting nurses are, are used to uh, seeing uh, or and managing. Um, as we know, a lot of times the visiting nurse is kind of facilitating the decision. I don't wanna say making the decision, but facilitating the, the decision on what treatment is appropriate for the for the wound. So having an understanding of what you're dealing with will really help reduce the risk of infection and improve your wound outcome. Um, so just again, this is kind of a, a putting it all together type situation. So what is contaminated and colonized, what is critically colonized, and what is infected. Um, next slide. So just uh, breaking it down again, contamination, colonization with replicating bacteria, but it's not it's not going crazy. Sometimes we're going we're able to a lot of times we're able to surgically remove uh, whether at bedside uh, and uh, bacteria is not pathogenic. We don't really need antibiotic treatment at this point. We don't really need antiseptic. Uh, we we could benefit from some antiseptic treatment here. Uh, next slide. Uh, critical colonization is where we see the wound just getting worse within the wound. The surrounding tissue still looks okay. We don't have, uh, you know, there may or may not be pain depending on um, the surface level of the wound. Organ organisms are within the wound bed. We're not into the soft tissue. Whereas when we see infection, that's when we that's when this inflammatory response is starting to generate, and you'll get pus and you'll get. Uh, the cellulite is looking around the wound, um, and you you will want quick action. So really, teaching your staff to pay attention to your wound edges and your peri wound areas is is key. And then you know putting the right product on the wound, which I mean obviously you guys know we could go 
on and on for which product to select, but I don't know if we have, we, I know we don't have that time today. Uh, next slide. Uh, and then just another, I'm just try, again, trying to give you tools to use with your staff as far as how to identify, um, you know, increasing clinical problems related to wound and sepsis. Obviously, you know, once a patient goes septic, depending on, you know, it could be quick, it could be uh, uh, a slower process, depending on their already immunocompromised status. So we wanna make sure we're really built uh, vigilant with monitoring of the wound. And, you know, for some of those cases uh, where your nurse is maybe providing wound oversight, um, helping justify within your documentation to happy to give strategies as far as uh, uh, making sure that the complexity of the wound and the risks are identified. So making sure the diagnosis is known that makes the wound healing at high risk. Immunocompromised status is identified and especially any drainage or amount of drainage is, is documented. So um, making sure uh, where you see intervention required, what intervention are you doing at this point? So is it application of silver? Is it getting uh, uh, the skilled professional in who can do debridement? Is it using starting to use a uh, chemical debriding agent or enzymatic debriding agent as well? Uh, or is it, you know, a combination of the topical wound care plus oral um, antibiotics or even IV. Next slide. Um, preventing wound infection. So some of these, I hope you guys can take away with, with your team if, if you're going to focus on wounds, but why we do what we do and how we help explain that to patients. Um, I, I, I don't know. I've had you know, especially newer nurses sometimes wondering why we are not doing sterile wound care when in the home, we know that's just not really realistic or even in the hospital setting. There are times for sterile wound care, um, but when it's an ongoing basis and you have, uh, you know, just regular contamination occurring, um, depending on what dressing you're doing, we know that sterile is no really, no longer really, you know, um, uh, that, that valuable. And the research on sterile versus clean technique and especially in chronic wounds, there's, there's just no, no valuable outcome. You know, there's no outcomes that sit, suggest one over the other. So we really use clean technique and, and until research proves otherwise. Um, uh, clean, uh, no touch technique is really what, it's, uh, uh, what it refers to and I'll get into that. Um, and then your steriles, you know, the best that you can you know, post-op is typically when we see it or within the operating room, we're seeing a lot of that, you know, more when they're doing a close up and maybe putting a disposable vac on or a dressing um, sterile that they went on for seven days. You know, we, they are seeing good outcomes in surgical wound uh, uh, prevention, uh, surgical wound infection prevention, especially when they apply a sterile dressing within the operating room and leave on. So that is, uh, that's definitely showing some good, good outcomes there. Uh, and specific patient populations where you might, might want to be as sterile as possible. In the home environment, it's, kind of, it's, it's tough, but it is doable. Um, and it's what you can't control is when you're not there, you know, so those are some of the key things. Uh, next slide. So clean, no touch technique is just trying to maintain that controlled environment as clean as is possible. You know, we use those, the sterile drapes here, you know, they're kind of, uh, our go-to for bag barriers, for extra room to put your catheter in, um, just making sure you're aware of, you know, the one-inch field for all those things. But, you know, we just, we just stack up on them. They, they can be a little bit costly, but it's worth it in the end. Uh, and it just provides, you know, you're not walking into the home, watching the clinician do wound care uh, and placing supplies on top of a newspaper or on top of a permeable uh, you know, paper towel or something like that. So, you know, that's one uptake up, you know, not super costly, but does, does have some cost to it, but it does, you know, really make a difference in kind of uh, how you're working in the field. Um, using sterile primary and sterile secondary dressings. I recommend this. We used to, we used to like order Curlex in bulk, but not anymore. When you do the cost comparison too, it's not that significant. So, um, you know, we 
order everything in individuals uh, to make sure that we're, you know, they're, they're, that they're just not exposed in their package. Cotton tip applicators, um, you know, versus using your gloved finger. Uh, cleaning solutions and devices for things that you need to clean, such as your um, uh, scissors, not taking scissors in between patients. So one-time use scissors for one patient, not one-time use, but patient-specific patient scissors. Uh, and non-sterile gloves are used. So next slide. The other thing that's key in wound care is cleansing. So how do I choose, uh, what, when do I use the right cleansing agent? What does my irrigation look like? There is actually a science to the irrigation based on pressure. Um, and so I've given you some key things. Now the bottles that you have, they're already pressure sensitized. So your, with your wound care sprays, um, when you when you turn it to the spray, it's not going to deliver a low or high enough pressure to uh, ineffectively treat the wound. Um, so you're okay there. But if you're using syringes or things like that, you want to make sure you're um, following kind of these guidelines for the pressure. Obviously, if you're doing too much pressure, you're pushing bacteria deeper into the wound bed. If you're not doing enough, you're not if you're not using enough pressure, then you're not really delivering. Uh, what the wound needs. And so uh, making sure that you're cognizant of that so that you know, you're know you doing the good wound care. And is debris an issue? Um, when do you use saline spray over a wound cleanser? Okay, so cleansers are not so, are non-selective. So they'll, they'll kill everything in the wound, including sometimes good bacteria. Um, you know, making sure when you're using a, a, a Dakin's or a Betadine, that you have a time frame on it. They do have time frames. Now, are there times where Dakin's for chronic use of wounds is appropriate? Absolutely. I mean, if you have a patient who's incontinent of bowel and bladder refusing a catheter and a stage four pressure injury to the cossack, where it's being, you know, where they're on a two feed and they have loose stools that get into the wound all the time, heck yes, use Dakin's. I mean, you wanna be able to keep that, that wound as clean as possible. Uh, Dakin's would be the most appropriate. Just make sure you're do, you know, doing it daily. So that's kind of the safest situation for a patient in that um, uh, current state. So, you know, those key things are key things to remember. Like, you know, nothing is, I mean, hydrogen peroxide considered taboo now, but, you know, when you're using these topical agents, you know, take the recommendation, but also consider you know, okay, what's the realistic approach for this patient um, in those situations? So next slide. Uh, I'm not gonna walk through this, but this is something good for your new staff, a very printable slide. And you guys can take this and use this. It's not, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, I'm happy to share it. I mean, we, uh, I, I just, you know, I want people doing good wound care. And we use this, you know, for patients' families too to teach them because how often do you see a patient family member doing wound care without gloves? A lot. Um, so, you know, just kind of how you get your, your prep your station, what you're looking for in your dressing removal um, and, you know, hand washing and things like that. Next slide. Uh, just a continuation. So what's, a, what's your wound care assessment look like? Making sure, you know, one thing about um, wounds is the measurements. Yeah, I mean, you're gonna have clinician discrepancy from person to person, especially when you're measuring down to the, you know, 3.4, 3.5, um, you know, it's just based on their vision, where are they setting the measuring tape? Look for obvious discrepancies. Make sure you have a consistent training of what length and width is. Remember length is, you know, based on anatomical position as well. So length is head to toe, width, width is, you know, side to side. So, you know, sometimes when you're, you know, looking at a heel and, you know, doing the best you can to get there, you, you might mix up your lengths and widths. So make, making sure that those are consistent and the clinicians are thinking about those things. Um, and just really taking care of your peri wound too. You know, you don't want to, if you have, if you think about it, if you have a really heavy exudating wound with, you um, uh, contamination and colonization, you know, bacteria hitting, it's pretty easy to get into the soft tissue if we're not uh, keeping a good eye on our uh, uh, wound, peri-wound area and wound edges. So 
just you know being cognizant of the whole thing, not just the wound bed itself. Um, next slide. Uh, high, so some highlights, always clean the wound prior to assessing the status of the wound. And this will help with your, you know, understanding your antimicrobial uh, stewardship because, you know, the first thing a clinician wants to do sometimes is take a picture of a, of a dirty dressing and a dirty wound. Uh, and that's not, you know, we've got exited, we might've had a dressing on there a while. Uh, if, you know, uh, drainage sits, it starts to smell. So clean your wound and then, and then evaluate the smell, evaluate what it looks like. Because sometimes you're just removing film once you clean it, some biofilm that's built up. Um, and then assess the wound because your clean wound looks a lot different than your uh, you know, dirty wound that you're about to change. So understanding how the wound heals. So that is key uh, for your clinicians where they're not maybe don't feel like they're seeing progress, but the wounds typically heal from the bottom up and the edge, edges contract inward. So when something heals from the bottom up, it, you're not really seeing uh, great healing at first, but then it, you know, after a few weeks, it comes into play. And knowing what dressing you're using and how it may affect or alter your wound healing. So I think a good example I like to use is Sample versus Accuzyme. So, San I mean, everyone knows Sample's our number one go to for enzymatic debriding. But there's also Accuzyme out there that you might see some people use here and there. You know, the difference is that Sample debrides a wound from the bottom up. So, that's why when you have, when you're using Sample, you have to have some granulation tissue or they recommend putting, uh, you know, some. Uh, uh, kind of mix in the wound to, so that the santo can penetrate down. And the reason for that is that santo debris from the, from the base of, of the uh, bacteria or slough up. So again, it's a little slower. And the reason that is so valuable is because it reduces um, moisture, you know, inappropriate moisture in the wound so that you don't get maceration or things like that. We're accusing the breeds from the top down, which can cause maceration uh, uh, and some dermatitis around the wound if you're not controlling the peri wound area. So understand why you're selecting and what you're selecting and, and making sure uh, to prevent those things. Next slide. Obtaining a wound culture. So making sure that your team's aware of how, of how to do this, because this is if we, if we have to move to that antibiotic treatment or we just have this delayed healing wound, we don't know what's going on, this is when I get a culture. Um, you know, I have assessed nutrition, the patient's got a good nutrition, the blood sugars are looking good, um, but this wound is just not making progress. Um, so I get a culture to see, okay, is there some underlying, you know, infection going on um, and making sure that I do the culture right. Number one, clean the wound prior to getting culture. I can, I, I've seen many clinicians go in and they want to get a culture on that wound that's not cleaned yet because they want to get that bacteria that's been sitting there for days. You know, don't want that bacteria. I want to expectorate, uh, you know, kind of press down on the good tissue and expectorate drainage onto that because that's going to give me my true uh, kind of uh, uh, microbes that are in there. You know, using a, zig, uh, a zigzag Z method, if possible. So first, always clean your wound, saline. Don't use soap and water, use saline before you obtain a culture, okay? You don't want to introduce, um, you know, the wound cleansers or anything like that because you, you're putting in extra. So saline, zigzag, avoid sloth and eschar if possible. It's not always possible, you know, uh, and avoid the peri wound, you know. Uh, next. Any next slide? Uh, teaching to patients and caregivers. So the best thing you can do is infection control practices are critical. Um, you know, making sure that they're following hand washing, making sure that they're protecting themselves. You know, sometimes you know caregivers don't realize that you know the the gloves are there to protect them, not not to protect the patient. Uh, so you know, making sure that they're aware of that. Uh, and then just step-by-step -step instructions, you know, we're required as of 2018, you know, with the conditions update, we have to give patients instructions on how to perform their wound care. 
Um, so making sure that, that those are in place and that, and that they feel confident with doing it in the home. Uh, and then just understanding what a clean environment is, um, backup plans for dressing malfunctions, uh, make sure you guys have those in place. I think that's important um, so that a wound is just not left open in case the nurse can't get there till the next day or your on-call nurse has three calls ahead of them. Uh, so backup, simple backup plans that patients can do when the nurse is managing the wound or you have a wound back, those things. And then just making sure your exercise nutrition, pain plans are in place, because uh, all of those help promote wound healing. You know, pain is one of the one things overlooked in wound healing, but pain causes vasoconstriction, which slows blood flow to the area. So pain control is important in wounds, uh, as well as, you know, respiratory management uh, because of hypoxia. Just make sure your agency protocol is up to date. Uh, and give your patients and caregivers good monitoring tools. I think that will really help them, you know, kind of manage the wound. And really the goal is to prevent infection and then heal the wound. Next slide. So what, I, what we provided you here is kind of your current state assessment. Like what, if I'm gonna choose wound, what are we doing right now? You know, observe some of your staff, you know, see how they're actually doing wound care. And I would say go in just, you know, this is a, a non-threatening type of, of situation because you want to see what they're really doing. You know, anyone can, uh, you know, in their everyday practices. So, uh, you know, go in just open-minded and then that's how you can kind of come up with your performance plan of, oh, we got to kind of change this or, oh, our dressing selection is pretty outdated. You know, if you're doing wet to dries, you guys, it's, uh, you know, if you look in the Joint Commission right now, the Joint Commission has kind of basically outlawed wet to dries. Uh, so you better have a, a really good reason on why that's being done. Like maybe you're doing it for an emergency, you know, the dressing fell off. This is what the patient puts on until the nurse gets there. That would be okay, you know. But if you're doing a long-term wet to dry, you know, the, everything surrounding that contraindicates um, um, good wound healing measurements or good wound healing measures. So. Any uh, questions on wound care, wound uh, assessment, um, something you don't agree with? A lot of it's taken from the updated uh, clinical practices. So um, how, or something in the home that you're concerned about, you know, uh, if you've worked in the home environment, you just know it's not always you don't have the tray tables and you don't have the, you know, uh, bed positioning that you always want. And sometimes you don't have someone to help you either. You know, when you're uh, wrapping a lymphedema leg and there's no one there to help lift the leg, it can get a little bit difficult. So those types of things. But if you have questions, though, you can always email me too. Uh, next slide. The other key thing that we're looking at uh, you know, focusing on best uh, practices is pneumonia. Uh, and so, uh, uh, next slide. You're gonna see some overlap in here between kind of nursing home, long-term care and home health, um, but really defining pneumonia, identifying the risk factors, identifying signs and symptoms and reviewing prevention strategies. I think it's key that your clinician and your physicians that you're working with know and understand that you can order x-rays in the home. You know, we can, and most of the x-ray, especially in Michigan, our area, for a, re, for a, for a chest x-ray are considered stat and they'll typically get there the same day. So understanding that those are options before always having to send the patient out, you know, because there's a lot of pneumonia that we can treat in the home and be successful with. And obviously added on top of this, if we have new respiratory signs and symptoms, we want to make sure we're doing our COVID tests on them uh, if we have the capability. Next slide. So pneumonia leading uh, cause of death due to infectious disease in the United States, the sixth leading cause aged over 65. I mean, it's uh, high, high readmission, 20% within uh, 30 days. Um, and trajectory of morbidity and mortality doesn't look great, you know, within the, within the year, especially add on top of that comorbid conditions. So, you know, these, you know, pneumonia is really tough uh, uh, to kick 
for people who are already immunocompromised and of elder, and elderly and have multiple medical conditions. So, you know, this is where good infection prevention and control comes into place and good monitoring. So your sepsis screens, um, you know, at our agency, you know, the, the condition of participation requirement and infection prevention and control is that the agency has um, ongoing surveillance for patients at risk um, or for those patients who have infection. So how do you engage your staff in regular surveillance? You do sepsis screening. I mean, that's that's pretty uh, pretty a pretty easy box to tick. Um, and I don't think anyone's going to, um, you know, anyone's going to fight you on that. I think you do will be above and beyond, to be honest. Uh, next slide. Um, in pneumonia infections in one or both lungs, low bar, segmental, bronchial, bronchi. Um, there's over 30 different causes. Uh, can be serious, fatal. We, we know all of this. Um, one thing that we recommend obviously as part of prevention, uh, and this could even be part of your performance improvement project. I mean, remember, it doesn't have to be crazy extensive, but maybe you have really low influenza, pneumococcal, COVID-19 vaccine rates in your patients, and your goal is to get those vaccine rates up, um, or even looking at your staff. So how am I implementing a COVID-19 performance improvement project that impacts my staff as well as um, my patients is looking at how do I get my team vaccinated? What are, what are those things? So, um, you know, uh, very, very kind of, I, I wouldn't say simple, you know how people feel about vaccines um, depending where they are. Uh, but, you know, those are things that you can look at doing in part of your performance improvement project from preventative measures. Next slide. Uh, risk factors for pneumonia, number one thing, uh, inadequate oral hygiene, especially in the long-term care facility in the hospitals. Um, that's always kind of been looked at really, especially those patients who are on ventilators and things like that. Immobility and poor functional status, aspiration, difficulty swallowing, altered mental status, so dementia, um, depression that's impairing cognition, recent hospitalizations, uh, Community exposure too. I mean, that seems to kind of fall under uh, those things. Comorbidities, lack of immunization, and smoking. Uh, the other thing that we probably would add here is, uh, or we'll be adding here in the next 10 years, is vaping. Um, so, next slide. Why is the older adult at risk? I think it's pretty obvious. We, we're all working in the, in the community right now. Um, in the cog cognition, diminished swallow, cough reflex. Uh, functionally dependent, dry mouth, medication, tooth decay or poor mouth care, um, behavioral problems during oral hygiene, so especially near dementia patients and things like that for un uncooperative. Uh, next slide. Um, so really significant independent factors. Again, we kind of already went over these, but just different. We try to provide different uh, slides that you might be able to accommodate to your staff better. So uh, we don't want to sound repetitive, uh, but some, sometimes something speaks more to you as the educator, the person facilitating. So we hope, uh, you know, you find benefit in that. Next slide. Um, really looking at, you know, I think one takeaway that I can talk about from just our operations, our quality operations experience in home health, um, when we originally did this, we did not have oral care in our teaching materials at all. And then when I reviewed charts, we weren't just nurses weren't discussing oral care um, at all uh, for pneumonia prevention or even in pneumonia patients. So that was our big aha gap moment. Like, oh gosh, we could really do some performance improvement here and training on staff. I think uh, you know. It, for some reason, it just wasn't it wasn't being communicated like that, and so really that was kind of when we looked into the policy and procedure and broke it down. That's what we found. So next slide. Um, this is just some preventative measures, as you can see. Oh, oh here we go. Uh, and then factors that increase the bacterial burden and colonization that increase the risk of pneumonia. I mean, they're all pretty. Pretty obvious from what, from what we've seen. So, ventil uh, ventilation, pH issues, um, 
tube feeding. So how are your tube feeding protocols? Do your nurses really know what the head of the bed needs to be at? Do they really know how long they need to be up? Um, how do you manage a tube feed in a patient with a pressure ulcer, you know, without uh, who has a continuous tube feed? So thinking through some of those key things um, uh, and how, how you're going to uh, really teach your staff and making sure they're doing the right thing and giving the right information. So how do you build out your intervention plans within your EHR? Do you spell it out for them to say, hey, this is the evidence-based measure? And we do have some of those like built into our EH electronic health record where um, I know this has nothing to do with pneumonia, but for daily weights. So for a person who can do a daily weight, making sure that you know it's the intervention is spelled out for the clinician to say, you, you will say exactly this because this is the best evidence-based measure that, to do it. So we want to make sure that the consistency is there. Next slide. Um, this is just some studies that you guys can review. It's just looking at how good oral care, uh, you know, can in really improve the, the risk reduction factors for pneumonia. Next slide. Especially aspiration. Here is uh, the what not to do. Again, um, some of the, what, what these really do is they dry out the mouth. And so when you're these not to do's, when they dry out the mouth, uh, it just increases that risk for the colonization. And there's nothing, uh, you know, there's the reduction in saliva and things like that. Next slide. Uh, just more, more studies that you can take with you. Next slide. Uh, next slide. It's just how oral care improves. So this is what I kind of want to uh, touch on is the proposed oral care plan, which will be in the toolkit. So it is spelled out for you. Uh, and just making sure, you know, it, it could be dependent on living environment because we all see patients in uh, uh, um, ALFs or group homes. Um, and we know that the level of the patient in assisted living facility now compared to 10 years ago is a much higher acuity. So a lot of these will, you know, these kind of follow you know, those guidelines um, out there, but what you can be teaching specific to your patients and how you can give the clinicians uh, kind of a pathway for what do I, what do, I do for oral, an oral care plan. So obviously you have your independent patient uh, versus what your dependent patient looks like and can they expectorate or not expectorate. CPC is just an antimicrobial uh, solution uh, found uh, used to um, reduce the bacteria of the mouth. Next slide. So this is this is what's in your uh, product in your um, toolkit so that you have this, and uh, it's really nice. I don't know whoever you want to put in charge of it. If it's if the uh, speech therapist is on the case, maybe the speech therapist is in charge of this part of the plan, or you know the nurse uh, can be in charge of this part of the plan as well as OT. I mean, this is a great thing for OT as well because you're. You're looking at the dexterity of ability to do things or does this have to be handed down to a caregiver to do? Next slide. Uh, role in preventing pneumonia, again, uh, kind of the take home is proper hand hygiene always, comprehensive or oral care, aspiration prevention measures or recognizing aspiration. You know, that's another thing is educating uh, the family, the caregivers for a new CBA patient who has uh, you know, when you start to observe coughing, frequent coughing or issues with swallowing and meals, you let us know right away. You know, doing swallow screens, proper positioning, immunization, mobility and lung expansion, adequate nutrition. You know, you know it's, just a, it, it's just a funny illness on the way, you know, how you can contract it, whether it's through aspiration issues or from communicable disease. Um, so, you know, it's really prevalent in what we see. Next slide. So kind of current state assessment. Again, notice your current state assessments will always filter back to proper hand hygiene. So, you know, making sure that that, that procedure is up to date and consistent with the CDC guidance uh, and making sure that your patients and families are doing that. I know for surveys, uh, uh, that is obviously they're always looking at that, but they're specifically looking at that this year. Uh, infection prevention and control issues. So 
making sure that you got comprehensive plans in place there. So oil care, preventing aspiration. Again, that's, you know, when do I report? When or what do I report as the caregiver? And then how are you training the clinicians as far as, um, you know, uh, uh, preventing aspiration from a sense of, are they on the right diet? Are they uh, sitting up for the appropriate amount of time? Uh, how are you handling cases that are a bit more complicated in the sense of, um, you know, it's gonna be a little bit tougher to prevent aspiration here, specifically like we talked about, continuous tube feed patient with a pressure injury on the cassette, you know. Uh, swallow screens, getting speech involved, obviously, you know, whenever there's a concern, I. I don't hesitate to put speech on, you know, to take it to the next level. It's just, you know, better safe than sorry. Lung expansion. So are you doing incentive spirometers? Do you have, uh, does your facility hand out incentive spirometers? Do your nurses carry them in their uh, car as part of their supply so that they can be there at day one? Are we working with the hospital discharge plan to say, hey, make sure the patient's sent home with an incentive spirometer? So all these different things that you can do as part of collaboration and you can get ready and what does your spirometer you know, program look like? Do you tell them to just do it once a day? Do you tell them to do it three times a day? Do you give them repetitions? All of those things, you know, build your protocol. And then new, you know, adequate nutrition. Obviously, when we're adequately uh, nourished and hydrated, we lower our uh, overall risk for infection and complications and dehydration. Okay, any questions? Next slide. Just wanted to quick check. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything in chat either. Oh, okay. Is anybody awake? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe we should do a quick poll here. Oh, <laughs> Next slide. Uh, last is we're going to look at uh, urinary tract infection, so caudies and UTIs. Um, uh, next slide. And we do have the, Janet did say that she feels that the information's excellent. She's going to be sharing. So yeah, these slides are that. always well yeah. received. So um, I, it's just nice to have, you know, you don't have to do the work here. You know, it's here and we're, we've already, Josh and I and um, Barb, before we even started this uh, new series, went through all these to make sure the practices are updated. So, um, you know, this we really just want you to take take it and run with it and, and build your build the best protocols you can. So, okay, next slide. So you're going to see some discrepancies. I'm just going to preface this with uh, uh, use of urinary catheters because this is. Um, obviously, some of the best practices out there are more related to inpatient and sniff stays, and that's getting the catheter out. In the home environment, we manage long-term catheters. So, you know, the long-term catheter is going in because the patient's retaining, uh, or they're out, you know, the, the risk benefit outweighs uh, not having a catheter. So if I keep getting a UTI because I'm retaining, you might as well put a catheter in because I'm uh, at risk for a UTI either way. Okay, so the best thing that we can do is, again, back to good infection prevention and control. And I'm sure you'll see on the, when we get to the end of this section, the first thing on the protocol is what your hand washing policy looks like. So there might be some, uh, so what you're gonna get today is the evidence base. What, what you do out in the real world might be a little bit different because you know once you're in the home, the patient has much a different control aspect over, uh, uh, how they want to manage their catheters. So, and I'll kind of get into, I think a good example, I have a, a personal patient example of a, of a male patient who obviously in the home, sometimes we encourage them to switch to, you know, life bag during the day, night bag, you know, uh, drainage bag at night because, you know, they produce a little bit more urine at night. And if they have the leg bag on, it kind of backs up and they feel full and whatnot. So he hated that. And he wanted to wear the leg bag the whole time. And that's okay. And to be honest, the guy, uh, we never, never, he never exchanged uh, and he never got a cotty either. So, I mean, 
you know, is it, would it be the recommendation? Probably not, but did it work for him? Yes. So, you know, you have to always consider patient, patient uh, preferences and these types of things, especially when, you know, this, this uh, you know, catheters are, can be um, a little overwhelming for patients as well as there's that whole body image, you know, issue too, especially when they're alert and oriented. So, um, how, how does the Caudi perform or perform? How does the Caudi, you know, kind of come about? Uh, and it's just really, you know, uh, in the introduction of bacteria somehow on the catheter that floats into the, uh, you know, into the urinary tract, or it's just not a, you know, the insertion wasn't great and you had a contaminated insertion. So, um, you also have patients though who have chronic catheters who have what's called, you know, kind of colonized bacteria in their bladder where we don't ever treat them unless they're symptomatic. You know, whenever you run a urine on them, you're gonna get the bacteria that comes back. They're gonna have a positive UTI. But if they're not symptomatic or anything, we're gonna be good stewards um, and, and just make sure we're continuing with good peri care, good catheter care and uh, good hydration. All right, next slide. So this is just uh, disrupting the life cycle of the urinary catheter. So we want to prevent unnecessary and improper placement. Kind of in the home environment, we don't really use catheters unless they're chronic catheters, except for where I think catheters are underutilized is when you have a pressure ulcer in incontinent patient. So if you have a pressure ulcer that's not getting better or worsening, you know, you want to have that catheter discussion as a temporary relief of the skin, or if you have really severe uh, IAD, because that's painful for patients and the skin just needs a break. So, um, I, you know, the, the hard part is getting the patient and family on board to try the catheter, um, but, you know, getting the skin healed, you know, it can be really help reduce pain as well. So maintaining awareness of proper care of catheters, prompt removal when they're no longer necessary. Um, and, you know, having the right equipment, you know, uh, as far as, uh, or being able to organize, you know, a bladder scan or something like that to prevent having to straight cat or something. Uh, and then, which again, goes to preventing catheter replacement. So prepping patients too, because, you know, they do come home with catheters where they plan to follow up with urology to be removed. You know, what is, you know, making sure that they're aware of, you know, after X amount of hours, you need to call, um, you know, do these things to try to avoid uh, all of those uh, extra things. Next slide. So medical indications, so urinary retention, uh, uh, wounds, prolonged immobilization, and end of life comfort. Uh, so inappropriate use is just the manage incontinence, unless the incontinence is causing uh, or worsening wounds, uh, infections, things like that. And then just because they're immobile, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean they need a catheter. Now it could be that could differ in the home environment because you know they might not have someone to help them. You know. Next slide. So Caudi, uh, remembering to you know how to prevent Caudi. This is just kind of a, a graphic that you can share with your staff. Um, you know, as far as catheter removal, you know when and when and why we would remove uh, aseptic insertion, regular assessments of the catheter, uh, training for catheter care and incontinence care planning in your toolkits. You have you'll have a really nice one pager on. Uh, catheter care for patients. So again, uh, those written instructions that you have to have for patients, we'll, we'll, we'll provide them to you as part of your conditions of participation. So again, you'll have written instructions for incentive parameter use, catheter use, uh, drainage bag use, wound care. Um, so that, that'll all be provided uh, in, in those toolkits. Next slide. Um, determining if if the catheter placement is appropriate. A lot of times this is done on, uh, on the inpatient side. There are times on the home health side that we might need to, for example, like straight catheter, uh, if the patient was, you know, the pulley, the pulley was pulled in the hospital, they did void, but then they come home and they have void for 24 hours. Okay, yeah, we should probably straight cat them. Uh, you know, it seems appropriate. Uh, 
or teaching patients how to straight cut themselves. You know, some patients just have to do that for the rest of their life based on, you know, uh, how they're relieving their bladder. Um, and then just making sure they have access skills. So is, is not putting a catheter in when we can resolve something with having a bedside urinal or having a bedside commode uh, and things like that. Next slide. Uh, just different external catheters uh, for uh, male patients. So condom cath. Next slide. Most common problems with them, number one, they're sticky, so they're uncomfortable uh, to pull off. Skin irritation, maceration, they can just fall off too. Um, if uh, there's re uh, retraction, they can cut off uh, circulation as well. Um, but, you know, in a short term, you know, kind of solution or, or something like that, that, they're not a bad option. Next slide. Uh, there's a hydrocolloid alternative. I've never used this personally. Um, it's a, uh, a wafer that adheres to the skin, just like a hydrochloride dressing. Uh, and um, it would act, obviously, it's as, as a skin protectant because it's hydrochloride, so you don't have anything touching. I know in the past, so, you know, with my personal use of a hydrochloride, they don't, they don't always necessarily stand up to uh, uh, fluids that great. But um, you know, sometimes they do. But the uh, next slide. And this is just shows kind of a before and after how a hospital was able to reduce their use of um, indwelling folate catheters without any uh, 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 without any bad outcomes related, you know, from folate catheter use to the external device for the hydrocolloid. So. You know, it is an option. I've never ordered it um, on the home care side. I don't know. I know Kay's on the call. I don't know if, she, if, if, they're, if Henry Ford orders it or not, or if anyone's had experience with it. But personally, I've not. Um, but I just want to throw it out there for an option. Next slide. Uh, so collection devices, uh, evidence-based review, expert uh, panel deliberations. Um, so how you incorporate your, the use of external devices, this is just kind of a bundled uh, look at a protocol. So you can kind of dive into this to see, you know, does this work for our agencies, uh, you know, as far as preventing or requiring the use of a catheter, when would we use it appropriately versus not? Remember, you have to kind of have in the home, you have to kind of have a trained caregiver who's comfortable putting this on, who's comfortable monitoring it, things like that, which, you know, some will be very and some will not. So you, you kind of got to weigh, you know, in the home environment, kind of weigh what and who you're working with, you know, being realistic. Next slide. So again, urinary catheter checklist, as I predicted, hand hygiene is first. Um, uh, we want to be aseptic as possible, sterile as possible when inserting the catheter, whether it's in the home or in the inpatient environment. You really should, you know, I know there's, you know, privacy of the patient, things like that, but if you have a patient who's willing to be observed for a catheter insertion, uh, you know, hopefully your nurses can kind of check off because you just want to make sure, you know, what do you do when you break the sterile field, you know, making sure that you have Good supplies because breaking sterile field does happen. Patient, you know, this is again, we don't have the tray table, we don't always have the tray tables or the right, you know, places to put things. So patients move, things get contaminated. Making sure that you have appropriate supplies so you can close it up and re and start over. You know, the last thing you want to do is uh, knowingly contaminate, you know, um, someone with with your insertion. So next slide. The do's and don'ts of indwelling catheter. So peri care again, that'll be on your teaching sheet. Uh, preventing kinking and tubing. So just troubleshooting. Uh, one thing I always ask patients is start at the bottom and work your way up. Do you have any kinks? Is anything cutting it off? Uh, you know, are you laying on? Is your mom laying on the catheter weird? Uh, so turn and position and things like that. Um, you keeping as close to them as possible when you can, but obviously in, in the home environment, it's a little different because we know patients really like leg bags during the day and, and drainage bags at night. 
um, replacing the catheter. So what is your frequency for that? Uh, and then that's, you know, obtaining urine samples. Remember, you know, I don't really think it's great practice to obtain a urine sample or uh, from a catheter that's already been, you know, if you've already taken, it's been in a while or, you, you know, you, you switched from lead to night bag, you know, probably best practice is to insert a new catheter and obtain a urine sample from that. Um, so, you know, if you really want to get an accurate sample, you know, you do see nurses kind of pull off the bag, even in the home environment, which just is not going to give you a quality sample. Next slide. Uh, the don'ts of, so this is where you'll probably see a little bit of difference of what they would do in the home. And that's the first one, don't, don't change the catheters or drainage bags at routine fixed intervals. Um, we do that. Uh, we just do it because it's a, it's a patient preference thing. Uh, and so, you know, it, like I said, a lot of these home patients who already have chronic catheters, they already have a lot of colonization as well. So really teaching them how to do it as clean as possible, you know, without, uh, you know, cleaning your, your ports and your tips and uh, making sure that, you know, you're not, you're touching anything that, that's being, you know, inserted or changed. Uh, use antiseptics uh, to cleanse the perianal area. Don't use that. Um, but, you know, just normal showering, you know, kind of tell them, you know, if you can shower with your catheter in, you know, you know, soap and water, uh, just normal cleaning. Uh, and, and good hand washing, that's key. Um, with the, the big thing that I don't have on here that we, we typically see a lot uh, is male catheters, uh, men with catheters sometimes uh, will get calls for bleeding. Uh, a lot of times it's because there's tugging that happens. So we encourage them to drink three, four glasses of water, kind of empty the bag to flush it out. Uh, and we, we have pretty good success with that. You know, it's typically because it's been pulled on something uh, and the bladder is just a sensitive area. So when it's pulled or tugged and, and you can kind of see that, uh, the bleeding. We see it more just in our male patients. That could just be specific to, you know, our agency or, um, you know, all around. Next slide. Just different securement devices. You know, I always recommend using a securement device. Number one, it reduces tug, com more comfortable for the patient. Uh, and it helps prevent, you know, kind of clogging and twisting and things like that. So that way there's always a good continuous flow going. Next slide. Drainage bag takeaways. Um, you know, always follow the manufacturer's instructions first. That should be at the top of all of your policies. Um, uh, and just make sure you know what manufacturer you're using. Uh, encourage emptying. So the recommendation is every two to four hours or, or three fourths full. Uh, your, your patients in their home probably, you know, some will go every eight hours. Some might do it more often, you know, just depending on what, what they prefer. Uh, stabilize the tubing, which we talked about, keeping the drainage bag below the bladder and off the floor. I always see them on the floor. So that's, that's a key edu education point. How to safely switch. So that, again, that goes to hand washing, that goes to uh, decontaminating with the alcohol swabs and things like that. Uh, and considering where to uh, place the drainage bag during activity. So, and also, you know, some patients, again, if there's some uh, body image issues, you can cover the drainage bag too, getting, getting that something to go over it. So it's not as, so it's a little bit more hidden. Next slide. Uh, this key takeaway for your leg bag. Next slide. Preventing UTI. So without, I mean, this is pretty straightforward. Your, your workbook, your uh, toolkit will have a one pager in there, which is really nice. You can use it for education with your patients. Uh, adequate fluid intake, always number one, light, light to clear. Um, adequate toilet, toileting. Uh, for females, cleaning front to back uh, and managing incontinence. The other thing I always recommend that kind of goes overlooked is, you know, washing your hands before going to the bathroom so that you're not, especially in, uh, you know, a lot of times with, the, with dementia patients, we see the, the uh, UTIs because, you know, if they're, if, if they're incontinent, bowel and bladder, number one, 
Uh, that's why you're seeing the E. coli typically in the urinary tract infections because the stool gets up into uh, the urinary tract, um, depending on you know what they're touching or their distant continent of that, those things. Um, so just really good uh, continence care uh, can really help prevent and making sure uh, their fluid intake is good as well. With patients with catheter disease, you would see. Um, but those without, you know, teaching caregivers how to monitor and what that looks like. Next slide. Uh, risk factors, uh, dehydration. Obviously in older patients, the sense of thirst goes down. So I was just explaining this to a, a patient the other day about how, imagine if you had to think about breathing every time, that's what happens to your thirst mechanism. You have to think about, you know, drinking. It has to be part of your day. You have to set an alarm or whatever you have to do. Because uh, you just you just don't have the thirst mechanism that you used to have. Um, uh, communication problems, uh, functional impairment, cognitive impairment, chronic diseases that uh, limit your fluid intake. That's that's a really, you know, kind of something you want to observe in in your charts and what your your nurses are teaching. So you know, if you have a patient with chronic frequent UTIs but they have severe heart failure on the fluid restriction. Make sure your nurses aren't pushing, you know, what is what is the safe fluid volume you can be pushing for that patient? Um, so in tying that piece together. Uh, depression, just because of self-care deficit. Right now we're seeing tons of social isolation. So that's another risk factor. Uh, and then, you know, fever, infection, vomiting and diarrhea, all risk factors for dehydration, your body's going into overdrive. So it's using everything that you have. Next slide. Signs and symptoms, uh, you know, again, this is more an infographic for you guys to use with your team. This is a great patient infographic too. Um, uh, next slide. Uh, and then preventing. So involving dietary and nutrition team, involving your speech team, is it a swallowing issue? Involving your OT team, is it a, is it a scheduling or IADL issue? Uh, and then again, making sure the physician is aware, you know, what's the plan for safe hydration of the patient. What does that look like? Uh, next slide. Uh, incontinence care planning, so prompt avoiding. Uh, so, you know, especially in uh, retainers or uh, patients who are incontinent, you can still get them up and do some time voiding if you have if you have the ability to do it. Now, in a home environment where it's, you know, a family taking care of grandma, and they're all really invested, it's probably really easy. An assisted living environment where you have uh, Alzheimer's dementia unit with, you know, especially now, say two caregivers and 20 residents, not as, not as, uh, not as easy to accomplish. So, you know, we have to consider those things, you know, a realistic approach is what can we do to um, be more creative in, in, in helping with that too. Habit training, time voiding. If there's a, uh, spasm issue or overactive bladder issue, uh, looking at some of the urological medications, uh, but just being aware of the side effects of uh, urinary retention. Um, and then absorbent pads, you know, for kind of what is, you know, absorbing the urine and things like that, obviously. Next slide. So just your current state assessment on UTIs and, and CAUTIs, what does it look like? Again, hand washing at the top. Um, how are we doing, uh, you know, with, with our prevention practices? Um, really, you can look at this as, uh, you know, obviously the bottom is indwelling catheter, but the, the other three without indwelling catheters still apply to indwelling catheter. I mean, you, you can still have incontinence issues with, um, you know, leaking around the Foley catheter or something like that, which can be common with, with spasms uh, and having your patients understand that. So, you know, uh, well, you wouldn't do a, a toileting, but you would do for, you know, for bowel movements, so different type of time toileting. But, you know, all these things, you know, you can put into practice, you know, to prevent UTIs and really look at what you're doing in place and observing your staff um, when appropriate on um, insertion and management of indwelling catheters. What do they know? You know, that's what I, you can also just interview them. You know, how do you teach a patient to manage this system? You know, this, this, this catheter system and what, do, what does the patient know to do and look for? And how can the patient troubleshoot? You know, things like that. 
Next slide. Um, so that is kind of a wrap up of our three key areas. Uh, and really the next takeaway, you know, or even if it's just in your planning, you know, if you don't have um, the ability to do it right now because you're working on your, your COVID-19 things, uh, understandable. But, you know, what would you, you know, what, what is your highest risk area, like when you run your data? Uh, and where can you start planning your next performance improvement project? Uh, you know, once once you really have to start looking into this again, or or maybe maybe you have, maybe you're to a point where uh, your hospitalizations related to wound infections is really impacting your 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 uh, patients going back, you know, your patients on service, uh, and your publicly reported data. So maybe you want to start something now. So really diving into that, you know, what is what's our biggest risk area right now? Uh, next slide. So, uh, so I we just asked by the next session that you um, maybe look at your current state assessment or start thinking. Or to me, I would even be happy if you looked into your data and say, hey, this is the area we've got to look at. Uh, and and then you know putting a plan in place. You know what would be your plan? What would your plan look like? You know as far as getting the staff uh, or getting getting change within your uh, organization. And how would you measure that? How are you going to measure that? So and then just continue to complete the steps of screening audits. We we, we really like love to hear feedback on what those look like. I think Kay gave some great examples today, so I appreciate that. Um, and then we'll just uh, plan on meeting back here in a month. Um, and I'm open to taking any questions. All right. Oh, it looks like there is. Oh, okay. Said great presentation. Um, let's see. Thank you, Kay. And. I'm not sure. Let's see. And I miss Janet said excellent information I'll be sharing. And then she said definitely not sleeping. Oh, sorry. Oh no, I get it because that was back to Eric's question, making sure everybody's awake, glad everybody. It was a lot of content, but most yeah, in previous sessions, people have really appreciated it. And I know I'm sure everyone appreciated all of the detail and information today as well. Um yeah, just Again, wanted to remind everyone that our next session is on Thursday, November 18th. It was in the previous slide, um, same time. If you don't have the invite, you can always email me, uh, blink at mpro.org, and I can connect you up and get you that link for the last session. Just a few housekeeping things quickly. Um, at the last session, we would like you to take the post-test, we had a pre-test, just sort of a knowledge test about sepsis and infection control. And then the post-test we'd like you to take at the last session as well. And then also we'll have a brief um, questionnaire um, and evaluation that we'd like you to take. And once you take that, then you get a certificate of attendance for these sessions. So um, that will be our last session for this group. And um, Again, as Eric said, if anyone has any questions uh, in between time, you can always just email me and I can get them to Josh or Eric and, and they'll respond as well. Um, okay, so I guess we'll, yeah, we're at the, at 11.30 mark. So um, unless anybody had any pressing things, we'll, we'll say goodbye until next time. <laughs>